Hello everybody. Hey, have you ever wondered when aircraft are flying along in the clouds and they can't see the horizon or what we call IMC or instrument meteorological conditions? How do they stay oriented? How do they stay upright if they can't see the natural horizon? Well, the answer is we're using gyros to replace the natural horizon. Hey everybody, welcome to the Epic Flight Academy. My name's Mike Thompson and this is the Instrument Rating Course. Today our topic is gyroscopic instruments. So how do they do that? Well, on board the aircraft we have three gyroscopic instruments. Let's take them in order. Let's start with the attitude indicator. Now you can see a picture of the attitude indicator here on the screen and it consists of a horizontally mounted gyro and that gyro is mounted in a gimbal frame. That frame allows the instrument case to rotate around the spinning gyro. If we spin that gyro fast enough, we're going to cause it to hold its position in space. That's called rigidity in space. And to spin that gyro, we use either air from an air pump or a little electric motor. Now, we're talking about the old, what we call six packs or the round dial instruments. And in this diagram here, you can see the vacuum system and how it powers that attitude indicator. Now, this attitude indicator does have some limitations. If it exceeds 60 degrees of pitch or 100 degrees of bank, it may have a difficult time maintaining its rigidity in space. It may actually fall over. We call that tumbling. When that happens, we say this gyro has tumbled. Our next gyroscopic instrument is called the heading indicator. Now, the heading indicator consists of a vertically mounted gyro, so it's spinning like this. And it is also inside a gimbaled frame. And it also has that heading indicator instrument moving around the gyro. This instrument has no magnetic input, and so it has to be readjusted to match the magnetic compass every 15 minutes or so. This instrument will also tumble if we exceed approximately 85 degrees of bank, it's possible we could tumble the heading gyro. So that's two. What is our third instrument? Well, our third instrument is called the turn coordinator, or its older sibling, the turn and slip indicator. Now, in the slide here, you can see that turn and slip indicator on your left. Notice in both the turn and slip indicator and the turn coordinator that you see on your right, that gyro is also mounted vertically. On the old turn and slip indicator, there's a white bar vertically, and as this aircraft yaws around a turn, this instrument will sense that yawing motion and tip that gyro, moving that white bar. And if we line up that white bar under that white box, and notice that white box has a little peak on top, we call that the doghouse. If it's lined up to the doghouse, that is a standard rate turn. Now, a standard rate turn could be three degrees per second, or it could be one and one half degrees per second. That depends upon the aircraft speed. Faster aircraft will require a steeper bank angle to maintain three degrees per second. So faster aircraft often fly at what we call half standard rate or one and one half degrees per second. If you are flying at standard rate of three degrees per second, you will make a 360 degree turn in 
two minutes or 120 seconds. So on the face of the indicator, you might see two min, two min. That means two minutes. That means this indicator is indicating at standard rate. It takes two minutes to go 360 degrees. If it's half standard rate, the face of that indicator might say four min or four minutes, or it's one and one half degrees per second or four minutes to go 360 degrees. Work with your flight instructor on how speed changes the rate of turn and the required bank angle. Now, the old turn and slip indicator gradually gave way to the newer, what we call, turn coordinator. And in the diagram, you can see the turn coordinator on your right. Notice the face of it looks just a little bit different. Instead of a ball, a, a, straight, a straight up and down white bar and two dog houses, notice it's got a miniature airplane. <clears throat> and that airplane will show a bank to the left or the right. And you can see on the face, if I line up the wingtip with that little white bar, that indicates a standard rate turn. Now, why is that turn coordinator slightly different from that turn and slip indicator? The turn coordinator is a newer version of this instrument and the mount for that vertically mounted gyro, notice, is tipped up slightly. It's actually tipped up 30 degrees, allowing the turn coordinator to sense both yaw and roll. That's the difference. Now, if you tune in for our next video, you're going to see how I'm going to explain that operation in detail. Also, on the turn and slip indicator and the turn coordinator, you're going to find a completely separate instrument. A completely separate instrument? Yeah, it's this little glass bar with the black ball in it. Now, it's mounted inside the face of this instrument, but it's actually independent, and it is called the inclinometer. And oftentimes, we just call it uh, the ball. But technically, it is the inclinometer. That ball is in this glass tube filled with a dampening fluid, like kerosene. It kind of dampens the movement of that ball. And we think of that ball moving in slips and skids, and well, that's true. But what the ball is actually responding to is a difference between roll and yaw rates. And then the ball will move one way or another in that inclinometer to help the pilot maintain coordination. So the turn coordinator and the turn and slip indicator are typically not powered by the air pump, like the heading indicator and the attitude indicator. These gyros are typically spun by a little electric motor. Well, hmm, I wonder why that is. The reason for that is redundancy. This way, if, let's say for example, the air pump were to fail and the attitude gyro and the heading gyro were to spin down and become unreliable, the pilot would be left with the turn coordinator or turn and slip indicator because they are run separately by a little electric motor. So folks, that's an overview of our three gyroscopic instruments. Join us for the next video where we talk about their internal operation in detail. See you next time.